Okay, so I'd like to spend uh, the next hour talking about efficient zero knowledge. Zero knowledge is another uh, another concept, a uh, primitive of, that was uh, discovered in the late uh, or invented in the late 80s. Uh, considered again purely theoretical, but something that we use as a very basic building block in many protocols, and it's of great importance, and it's more magic, so it's, uh, it's nice to see. Before we can talk about zero-knowledge proofs, we have to talk about what a proof is. In general, we used to reading proofs in books, uh, mathematical proofs, we read a theorem, afterwards read the proof, and we don't necessarily think about actually what we're doing in that process. And a typical proof has two parts. One is called completeness, and the other is called soundness. So a proof system, is something that is able to convince you of a true statement, that's completeness, but will not convince you of any false statement. And when you think about basic logic and the concepts of basic principles of basic logic, uh, this has a lot to do with coming up with proof systems and how you can prove theorems in a way that will guarantee both completeness and soundness until Gödel came along and messed everything up. We won't talk about that now. Uh, classic proofs. Uh, were written by hand, non-interactive, it's what we still do today when we open a textbook and we uh, read the proof. The prover spends a lot of time, uh, hopefully a lot of time, so it'll be easier for us to verify. In, in papers it's sometimes the opposite. Uh, interactive proofs work very, very differently. Interactive proof is kind of like me standing up on the stage and convincing you that the statement is correct. And here the prover and the verifier interact uh, however, it's not that you're convinced by my charisma and uh, smiley face, but actually there is some sort of mathematical guarantee coming out of the proof that actually uh, a correct statement will be proved and I'm unable to convince you of an incorrect statement. And actually it turns out that from a computational complexity point of view, adding interaction uh, is, enables us to prove a much more powerful uh, theorem. So, Again, from the world of computational complexity, we can prove everything in p-space versus a classic proof which is limited to NP only. So I want to start off by just looking at a concrete example and doing, doing this very, very, uh, um, doing this uh, uh, very informally. But I want to um, talk about what happens if I, I'm a prover and I have two graphs. And I want to prove to you or prove to some verifier these graphs are not isomorphic. Now, proving that something that two graphs are not isomorphic is, is quite difficult, actually. It's not in NP. We don't have, I don't have any short way of telling you that there does not exist an isomorphism. Now, if two graphs are isomorphic, then it's give you the mapping of the nodes from one graph to the mapping of the nodes of the other graph. And you can compare and see that all the edges line up. But I want to tell you the graphs are not isomorphic. So how, how can I do that? In fact, I can't write down, or we don't know of any way of writing down a short proof of that statement. So I want to show you how interaction can help and, and, and just in that way give you the feeling that interaction is actually of, is helpful. So the prover claims that G0 and G1 are not isomorphic and would like to convince the verifier V of that point. So the verifier starts off by choosing a random bit and computing a, a random permutation of one of the two graphs of, of G sub B. So there are two graphs and he computes a random permutation of one of them and sends this permuted graph to the prover P. The prover will now try and find which graph, which of the two, G0 and G1, this graph that it got from the receiver is isomorphic to. Okay? Now, uh, and then once it learns that, it'll send the bit back to V. Okay? So the verifier just chooses one of the two graphs at random, computes a random permutation of the graph and sends it to the, to the prover, and the prover then will find which of the graphs it was isomorphic to and will tell the verifier back. That's the entire proof system. Now, why, why is this at all helpful? Well, completeness is easy. If the two graphs are not isomorphic, then whatever graph the prover gets is going to be isomorphic to only one of G0 and G1. And so, by heavy computation, but it's able to, the prover is able to find which of the graphs it's isomorphic to. It can compute all the permutations of the, pos of the graph and see which one it matches to. It will only match one of them and therefore the prover will always convince the verifier that uh, if the statement is correct. But what happens if the statement is not correct? If the statement is not correct, that means that in this case the two graphs G0 and G1 were isomorphic. So in fact one of the graphs is a permutation of the other graph. If one of the graphs is a permutation of the other graph, then when the verifier sends 
a permutation of one of them, the prover has no idea which one it started with, because we have two graphs that are, that are isomorphic, and we add another graph that's isomorphic, if, even if the verified generated from this one, but there exists a permutation also from that one. So the prover actually has no way of knowing where the verifier started with. And then what that means is the prover cannot know which, which uh, uh, graph the verifier started with with greater, prob greater than uh, probability one half. So probability one half, the prover will be wrong. Okay? And if you re repeat this many times, then the probability of error will, re will reduce exponentially fast. So we have is a system that if the two graphs are not isomorphic, the prover can indeed convince the verifier of this fact. But if the, pr if the graphs are isomorphic, then the prover will uh, inevitably fail, or with, with each iteration, we probably one half will be, be caught cheating. So this shows the interaction is very, very powerful. Graph non-isomorphism non is not known to be an NP. We don't know of any short proofs. Yet it's possible for a prover to, to convince a verifier where the verifier is, is efficient, uh, um, just by using this interaction. And, and the fact that the verifier uses flips coins is actually an inherent part of, of gaining power in interaction. So we're actually not interested in gaining power. We don't want to necessarily prove more powerful theorems in cryptography, but we want to add an additional pro property which is called zero knowledge. And zero knowledge uh, is this magical concept which says that I want to convince you that something is true, but without revealing anything but the fact that it's true. So you won't learn anything except for the mere fact that the statement is true. You won't know anything about why it's true, uh, uh, um, what's the uh, uh, claims behind the proof that it's true. You won't learn anything about that. All you'll know is that it's true. And this has many applications in, uh, uh, that we'll see them in, in secure computation over the next few days. But for example, if uh, let's say I have an encrypted database and the court subpoena comes along and says, you need to provide, you need to decrypt the email that was sent uh, on uh, the 20th of December 2011. And uh, the problem is that it's all encrypted under a single key and the only way that I can prove to the judge that actually this is the correct, uh, this is the correct email is by, is by providing the key. So I have to actually provide the key to the court and, but that enables the judge to open all of the emails and not just the specific emails of that day. But if I can prove in zero knowledge, I can provide the plain text and prove in zero knowledge this indeed the value that was encrypted, then I can limit the damage to only actually the minimum that's absolutely necessary. <coughs> so that's, for example, one application uh, that, that you could use zero knowledge for. So in zero knowledge, again, just like before, we have a prover, P, we have a verifier, V, and we have a statement X, which can be an arbitrary statement like this ciphertext encrypts this value or uh, anything else. Now, P is going to prove that X is in a, in, oh, so we already have a language L. The language L is, uh, uh, for example, uh, pairs of plaintext ciphertext, and indeed this ciphertext encrypts this plaintext. So it's an NP statement. We'll talk things about, uh, you know, you could uh, prove things uh, like, um, oh, we'll see examples later on. For now, just think about something which is easily verifiable. So this is an encryption of this, uh, of this plaintext if you had the secret witness, which is the MP witness. Now P is going to prove that X is indeed in the language without revealing anything but that fact. So we're going to require completeness just like beforehand, because it's a proof system. We're also going to require soundness just like before, because it's a proof system. So we don't we want to make sure that no cheating prover, which we to know with P star, no cheating prover will be able to successfully convince an honest verifier that, uh, X is in, that, that X is indeed in the language if it's not. So for every X not in the language and for every possibly cheating prover, the uh, verifier should reject. Uh, typically, uh, a proof system, we say a proof system, we need even an all-powerful prover, although uh, typically in cryptography it's enough for us to consider computational soundness, which means that only a polynomial time prover should not be able to cheat you. And then we're going to ask for zero knowledge. And zero knowledge means I shouldn't learn anything except the fact that the statement is true. Now this itself, again, we come back to the uh, 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 problem of how do we define that uh, nothing but the fact that the statement is true is learned. Well, this is actually easier to define than we did this morning, so, so it should be quite natural now for you to, to, to think that we just have a simulator who's able to generate the view of the verifier 
uh, by seeing the statement alone. So there's, there's a statement and there is a proof, a written proof, some secret witness of the statement, but we want to actually convince the verifier without revealing that. And we're going to say that the verifier did not learn anything if its view in the transcript and the proof can be generated just by the statement alone. And once again, this comes back to the, the notion that if the verifier could learn something from the real interaction with the prover, then we can just run the simulator and give that verifier the output of the simulated transcript and the verifier would still be able to learn what it learned. And that basically means that all the simulator, all the verifier learned is that's what's actually efficiently uh, derivable from the input statement. Formally, we say that for every possibly cheating verifier V star, there exists a simulator so that the output of the simulator when given only the input X is indistinguishable from the output of the verifier in a real interaction with the prover. Note that if we're thinking about in the secure computation type concept, we have two parties. Soundness and zero knowledge are exactly the cases where one party is corrupted versus the other party is corrupted. So soundness deals with the case the prover is corrupted and is trying to cheat the verifier by uh, convincing uh, uh, the verifier of an incorrect statement. And zero knowledge is the opposite case where the verifier is trying to cheat the prover by learning more than he's allowed to learn. So he's not supposed to know anything except for the fact that the statement is correct and he's trying to somehow gain extra information and he's trying, going to try to cheat uh, in, in that goal and what the zero knowledge uh, property says is that he's unable to do that. Uh, just if you want to think about real world type uh, an example of how such a thing could be done, um, let's think about someone who uh, has, there's someone who's colorblind and they can't tell the difference between red and green. Okay? And I have, there's a card, that person has a card, and uh, they come to me and they, sorry, they have two cards. One is supposedly red and one is supposedly green. And they, uh, oh sorry, they, they, they have two cards and they come to me and say, uh, are they both the same color? They're different colors. They say, no, they're different colors. One is red and one is green. And I now want to prove it to that person, but without actually uh, revealing anything about which is the red one and which is the green one. So what, they, uh, uh, what, what, what I can do is I can take the two cards and write random, random numbers on the back, a zero on one of them and a one on the other, and then the uh, verifier will hold up the, uh, and so they have different numbers on the back but they're random, they're not correlated to red and green, and the, the verifier can hold up one of the cards and I have to tell him whether it's the zero or the one card. If both cards are the same color, then on the back it says zero and one, but I'm unable to guess with probably better than one half what's on the back of the card because they're both the same color. But if they're different colors, I'm able to succeed every time. Now we can do this many times, each time choosing different, different random bits on the back of the card, and the verifier actually learns nothing about which is the red card and which is the green card. Because every single time it could actually, all, all it does is just write zero and one on the back and, and holds it up and gets told the same number which is on the back of the card. So it learns absolutely nothing. But on the other hand, the verifier is fully convinced that the cards are a different color because every single time I'm able to guess correctly. So this is, this is the sort of the idea behind zero knowledge. There's also something called the zero knowledge proof of knowledge which is uh, significantly more complex, but I don't want to go into the full form, uh, formalization of it. All I want to say is that here the prover is also going to prove not just the statement is correct, but it also actually knows the witness. And here you have to define how, what does it mean for a machine to know something. Uh, it's hard to actually test if someone knows something. Anyone who's written an exam for students knows it's hard to test if a student actually knows. Maybe we should write an extractor and see if they can output the lecture notes. That would be a good, uh, a better system than exams maybe. Uh, what it means is that there is some machine which will, an extractor we call it, which will interact with the, the prover and is able to actually get the witness at the end. So we might sometimes want that, let's say somebody has an RSA, a public key, and before we issue them a certificate, we want to know whether they actually know the secret key that's associated with that public key. So they didn't copy it from somewhere else. So one way of doing it is to ask them to sign in a random value. The problem is that maybe when I ask them to sign the random value, it's actually not random, it's actually a check for $10,000 and they don't actually notice. So you actually, they're actually generating a signature and maybe that signature can be used somewhere to actually attack them. Instead, we'd like to have them prove in zero knowledge that they know the public key, the private key. 
Now here, just a regular zero knowledge proof is not good enough because that would mean there exists a, pri a private key. Well, of course there exists a private key, that we all know. We actually want to know that they know what that private key is, and this you would need a zero knowledge proof of knowledge for. Okay. Another equivalent way of looking at it, if you want to think about it in the secure computation uh, uh, notation, is we have a, a function which the prover has the statement and the witness for the statement, which for example in the RSA example, the public statement would be the public key and the witness would be the private key. The verifier has the public key and the output is nothing to the prover because he doesn't need to learn anything. And the relation applied to the input and uh, public input and witness to the verifier, so for example, the relation saying, yes, indeed, this is the private key associated with that public key, and the verifier will get one or zero, meaning yes or no, this is correct or not. Okay, so uh, it's an amazing concept. A central basic result of uh, a theory of cryptography is that actually any statement can be proved in zero knowledge. Not only every statement in, 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 in NP, actually every statement in IP can even be proved in zero knowledge. This was proven by uh, uh, GMW, or the, f the fact that every statement in MP can be proven in zero knowledge was proven by Godreich, Macaulay, and Vigderson in 86. And this means that anything that you want to prove can, in principle, be proven in zero knowledge. But like this morning when we said that any functionality that you want to compute can be securely computed under the definitions that we presented, the question is how efficient this can be made. And the standard way of proving such this statement is that you give a proof of three coloring or Hamiltonicity, which is an MP complete language, and you do a car production to that. And no one has yet, that I know of at least, implemented a car production in software. Uh, so maybe Benny, who did Fair Play the first time, can actually do a project where he implements uh, a car production. But it seems to be not very efficient. So it seems that zero knowledge for interesting and complicated uh, languages is going to be very expensive. And what I'm going to show you now for the rest of the next uh, 40 minutes, how much do I? next half an hour, 40 minutes, is uh, that, uh, for the next 40 minutes, is that we can actually do this very efficiently for a lot of languages that we're interested in, and it's very useful within <coughs> secure computation. So the tool that we're going to use, and this is something that Ivan was very, very, uh, um, instrumental in, in, in pushing out with this is a concept called Sigma Protocols. So a lot of this is based on, on Ivan's, uh, Ivan's work. And it's a way to obtain efficient zero knowledge, but not only is it a way to obtain efficient zero knowledge, it's also much, it's a very, very easy tool to work with. It's much easier to work with Sigma Protocols than to actually work directly with zero knowledge. So there are many general tools for it and many interesting languages that can be proven with this Sigma Protocol. And I'm going to start with uh, an example and not with a definition. And the example is uh, discrete log. This is actually Schnorr's protocol. This is what it stands behind Schnorr signatures, actually, uh, although we won't go into that too much. So we have some group G of order Q with a generator G. And P and V have a public input, which is H. H is a group element. It's equal to G to the power of W. So W is the discrete log of H. And the prover actually has W. And the prover wants to tell the verifier, I know the discrete log of H. I know this value W, so the G to the power of W equals H. And the verifier says, OK, well, prove it. So this is what they do. Uh, P chooses a random R and sends A, which is equal to G to the power of R to V. So this is just a random group element. The verifier then chooses a random challenge, this value E we call a challenge, is a random challenge, E of length T. And the prover then replies with the value Z equals R plus EW mod Q to V. That's it. The verifier then just checks that G to the power of Z equals A times H to the power of E. Okay, that's the protocol. It doesn't make too much sense as to why this gives completeness, soundness, what connection it has to zero knowledge. But I just want to note that if you look at this value, R plus EW, it doesn't, the value W, which is what we want to hide, is masked by R. Now it's not so simple because R is not completely secret, but it's in the exponent here. So it's, it's not completely hidden, but on the other hand it's not revealed. So the fact that this hides something is actually what we have to prove but uh, it's, it's, 
at least in principle we know that you can't compute the discrete log, you can't find the R, and so somehow R is protecting W. Okay, that's the proof. Let's start with completeness. Completeness says that if the statement is correct, then the prover can indeed convince the verifier, or here the statement is always correct because every group element has a discrete log, but let's say that if the prover has the value W, then it will always succeed in convincing. And just notice that if we, the verifier checks that G to the Z equals A times H to the E. So G to the Z is simply G to the R plus E W, because that's how Z was computed here. So it's G to the R plus E W. Well, just the regular rules of exponentiation work also in groups. So that's G to the R times G to the W E. I can just move to just change the order here. And G to the W is H, so, and G to the R is A, so that's exactly A times H to the E, and all of this is public information. So the prover sends what's in the exponent, and the verifier is able to check that this actually matches the public values that it knows, which are A, H, and E. Okay, completeness is not that difficult. We need to actually see that we have soundness. So the protocol is now up on the right-hand side here for you to refer to when I argue now soundness. And soundness is the... Uh, interesting part, what I'm going to actually argue is that it's a proof of knowledge. When I say it's a proof of knowledge, it means that if the prover can convince the verifier of this statement, then it actually has to know the value W. And I'm going to prove that by showing you that if the prover can answer just two queries, two different queries, E1 and E2, for the same first message A, then I'm able to get W out of that prover. Now let's think about what that means. The prover sends the first message A, and then the verifier chooses this random challenge of length t. t could be 40 or 80, so there are 2 to the 40 or 2 to the 80 possible challenges. If the prover can answer two of those, then it must know w. And I'm actually able to show that I can e efficiently extract w from such a prover. So if it can prove with probably greater than 2 to the minus t, then I can efficiently extract w, and that means the prover has to know w. So let's see how I can do that. Again, we have the single value A, which is going from the prover to the verifier, and then the verifier chooses the E, and it can answer for E1 and E2. So we get two possible answers in the... We have two executions, A, E1, Z1, A, E2, Z2, and the verifier, and we receive both of these executions. For the same A, we have these two continuations. Now, since they are both convincing, it means that G to the Z1 equals A times H to the E1, and g to the z2 equals a times h to the e2. That's what's written up there. Now we just do some manipulation. That means that we just uh, uh, put a on one side, so it means that a equals g to the z1 times h to the minus e1, but it's also equal to g to the z2 times h to the minus e2. Okay. But that, now we, that means we have equality between these two values here, so we can now just uh, uh, move things from side to side and we get the g to the z1 minus z2 equals h to the e1 minus e2. Okay, but where am I going with this? This actually means, though, that the exponent for h, h to the w, is actually g to the z1 minus z2 divided by e1 minus e2. So if you raise g to the power of this value, you'll get h. So this is actually the discrete log of h. But what I want you to notice is that z1 is, is public, because that's the third proof of message, z2 is public, E1 and E2 are public because they're the, the verifier challenges. Computing an inverse, which you need to do here, modular Q is easy, just use extended Euclid. So actually what we have is that if I can get this execution where I have A, E1, Z1, E2, Z2, trivially I can compute the discrete log W, but just by computing this value here. Okay, so this can be efficiently computed, and that means that if the prover can answer with probability greater than 2 to the minus t, which is missing here, then it actually must know the discrete log. Okay, so that's the soundness, and it's a very, very uh, powerful argument showing that indeed the prover knows this value. What about zero knowledge? Is this actually zero knowledge in the sense that I can simulate? It's, it seems not, although I won't go into why not right now. What I'll do instead is I'll show you that it meets something called honest verifier zero knowledge. Honest verifier zero knowledge is the semi-honest version of zero knowledge. So in, in secure imitation we say semi-honest and malicious, and in zero knowledge we say honest verifier zero knowledge and regular zero knowledge. But it's the same thing. So if the verifier is semi-honest, I want to show you that I can actually simulate 
fully this transcript. And it's very simple, I just reverse the order of things. What I do is I choose a random z and e, so I choose the last two values in the proof, and I compute a to equal g to the z times h to the minus e. Okay, I can do that. And all that means, if you look at this transcript a, e, and z, it looks like it has exactly the same distribution as the regular proof. In particular, the verification works because g to the z equals a times h to the e. Just by looking here, if you transfer this to that side, you get g to the z indeed equals a times h to the e. And also, by the algebraic properties of the group, a is actually a random, uh, uh, random group element. So, by working in reverse order, you can actually completely simulate this uh, proof. This also actually solves the mystery of how can zero knowledge not contradict soundness? Right? If I can actually compute the transcript by myself, then I should be able to uh, uh, convince, or I should be able to uh, um, convince of an incorrect statement because the prover can just generate a simulated transcript and give it to you. The answer is that the prover has to give A and only then learns E, and that's what forces soundness. Whereas in zero knowledge, I'm allowed to have this trick where I can actually choose E and Z and afterwards compute A. Okay, now honest verified zero knowledge is not that helpful uh, because we don't like semi-honest so much. And in the semi-honest world, if you think about it, all we need is one of the parties to say the other, it's correct, trust me, because I'm not allowed to cheat. Right? So if I say to you it's correct, it's correct, trust me, that's actually a very good proof. Um, but honest verified zero knowledge is a, uh, is a tool that we'll use, it's a stepping stone that we'll use to actually get full zero knowledge and we'll be able to, uh, it will be useful, don't worry. Okay, so now given we've had this example of Schnorr, let's define what we mean by a sigma protocol. And the nice thing about sigma protocols is that it's, uh, they have less, uh, it, it's, it's sort of a much cleaner definition than, than general zero knowledge. So P and V both have an input X, P has a private input W, which is a witness, and the protocol has a very specific uh, template. The prover sends the first message A, the verifier sends a random T-bit message challenge E, the prover sends a reply Z, and the, v, and the verifier accepts solely on the basis of this transcript X, A, E, Z. For those of you from the world of zero knowledge, this means that it's a public coin proof system. <coughs> Completeness is the usual one. Soundness is a different, different definition. We're not going to say that a cheating prover can only uh, convince of an incorrect statement with Zenger's probability. Instead, we're going to say something called special soundness. And that means that there exists an algorithm A. So they're given any X, any statement, and given any two transcripts, AEZ and AE prime Z prime, with the same first value A, but a different second value, so E and E prime are different. There is an algorithm, so given any two transcripts of that, like that will output a valid witness. Now if you think about that, if you're able to output a valid witness, that means that the statement is true. By definition, it's just, you can't, the, an incorrect statement doesn't have a witness. So that means that the statement is true. Not only does it mean the statement is true, it means that the prover who succeeds in proving has to actually know that witness because uh, if it can succeed with probability greater than 2 to the minus t, that means that it can answer at least two queries. If it can answer at least two queries, then we're done. We can extract the value. And the last uh, property is special honest verifier zero knowledge, which means that there exists in a simulator machine M that is given X and a challenge E and will output A, E, Z, which has exactly the same distribution like a real uh, proof between the prover and verifier. Okay, so this is uh, uh, a sigma protocol. Just want to let you know that from experience, proving that a protocol is a sigma protocol is actually quite easy. Uh, proving that something directly is zero knowledge is actually quite a pain. So this is uh, uh, also beneficial. Now I want to go to the next step and show you a sigma protocol for a more complex language uh, in the sense that not every statement is correct. And it's going to be the relation of Diffie-Hellman tuples. So it's, we have G, H, U, and V. And this is going to be Diffie-Hellman tuple if there exists a value W so that U equals G to the W and V equals H to the W. 
If you think about uh, uh, why this is called Diffie-Hellman, in Diffie-Hellman's uh, key exchange, essentially the first party will send H, the second party will send U, and the key that they'll use the results of Diffie-Hellman key exchange is going to be V. Okay, so we want to prove that indeed this tuple is a Diffie-Hellman tuple. It's useful in many, many protocols. So actually the system is very similar to Schnorr. The prover chooses a random R, but instead of just computing G to the R, it computes G to the R and H to the R. Okay, that's A and B, and it sends A and B to the verifier. The verifier again just chooses a random E, and then the prover sends the same thing as before, Z equals R plus EW mod Q. And the verifier now checks two things. A, that G to the Z equals A, H to the E. And secondly, that H to the Z equals B, V to the E. Okay, so A, U to the E and B, V to the E. It's up on the side to C. Completeness is the same as in discrete log, it's obvious. And special soundness, actually we get exactly the same property. Okay, so we can do exactly the same analysis as beforehand. And we can show that, uh, this could actually be divided by here. We can show in exactly the same way that if, you can, if the prover answers both of those queries, then actually you can extract W. And the reason why this works is very simple. We, we're actually just showing the same relation between uh, G and U and H and V. It's exactly the same relation, and this means that the same W is correct for both of those values. Likewise, it's also special on this verifier zero knowledge, because you can just compute, uh, again in the reverse order, if you're given E, you can just choose uh, a random Z and do A equals G to the Z times U to the minus E, and B which is H to the Z times V to the minus E, and everything goes through. And so this is very, very, very powerful, and I'll show you later on some examples of where really non-trivial statements that you can prove using, uh, using this proof system. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, any sigma protocol is an interactive proof with soundness to the minus t, because if you can extract a, state, a, a witness, then the statement must be true. There are also very nice properties of sigma protocols. For example, if you run many in parallel, then you can use a single challenge E for many different proofs, and, and everything is fine. Uh, it's also a proof of knowledge and a standard notion of proof of knowledge with an extractor. And there are many, there are some many, uh, very many, there are many very powerful tools for signal protocols. One, for example, is you can prove complex compound statements. So you have a number of uh, zero, a number of statements. You can prove any and or, or subset of those statements very efficiently. So I can say either the first statement is true, or the second statement is true, and the third statement is true and so on and so forth. Or I can have n statements and I can prove to you very efficiently that exactly half of them are true. This, uh, this is surprising uh, how uh, that you can do such things. And also the construction, which is by uh, Kramer, Lumgard uh, uh, and Schoenmacher, is really, really a, one of the most beautiful uh, uh, protocols that I know of, so I, I really uh, um, suggest uh, reading it. Two other very, very important things which we'll use it is, is that we can compile and get full zero knowledge from sigma protocols very, very efficiently. And likewise, we can get full zero knowledge proofs of knowledge from sigma protocols very efficiently. So in my secure computation protocol, if I need a full zero knowledge proof, I can get it very, very efficiently from this. And if you look at what we actually did here, this is really efficient. Uh, so what are we doing? Uh, the prover is doing two exponentiations and the verifier is doing uh, for exponentiations. So that's really, really efficient. Okay, so how do I get zero knowledge from sigma protocol? Uh, I need to start with commitment schemes. And actually I told you about commitments this morning when I did El Gamal for, uh, for the coin tossing. But a commitment is an envelope. Okay, I take an envelope, a not see through envelope. I write something down, I put it inside the envelope and I give it to, give it to you. At that point, before you open the envelope, you have no idea what's written inside there. However, I'm unable to change what's there. So this is binding and hiding. I am bound already to the value that's inside the envelope. I can't change it because you're already holding the envelope. On the other hand, you don't know anything about the value that's there, so it's still hidden from you. Again, once again, as in many things in cryptography, these are sort of paradoxical properties 
because it, you would think that if the value is hidden, is hidden, then you can't be bound to it. But no, you can be both. It can be both binding and hiding at the same time. So there's a commitment phase and then a reveal phase or decommitment phase. And the property is that after the commitment phase, the committer cannot change anything. Uh, and yet the, verif uh, the, the receiver doesn't know anything about it. Now there are a number of variants here which are based on whether the binding and hiding are perfect or computational. Whereas perfect means that even if you're an all-powerful adversary, you cannot cheat. And computational means that it's only if you're polynomial time. You can't have both perfect binding and hiding, that's proven, but you can have something which is perfectly binding, which means that even an all-powerful prover cannot, powerful pro uh, sorry, an all-powerful committer cannot change the value that's inside uh, after the commitments phase. And perfect hiding means that even an all-powerful receiver does not learn anything whatsoever about the value that was committed to after the commitment phase, but in that case the binding is only computational. So if the uh, committer is, is uh, uh, all-powerful, then you can cheat with binding. Again, in cryptography we typically don't care, we want computational. However, it's worthwhile noting that when you want to prove the security of protocols, sometimes having perfect things inside makes life a lot easier. So for example, in a perfectly binding commitment, the value that was committed to is fully defined. Whereas in a perfectly hiding commitment, it's not at all. In fact, all possible values are there, it's just that the committer won't be able to open uh, to M more than a single one. So it, it does make a difference when you're proving. So the El Gamal usage that I showed this morning is a perfectly binding commitment. Why is that? The commitment, if you remember, was G to the R, G to the S, and then H to the S times M. And we said that these three values, uh, H, U, V, fully define M. Why do they fully define M? Well, there's just a single pair R and S so that H equals G to the R and U equals G to the S. Because within a group, this is, these are exponentiation is a, uh, at least when it, it, exponentiation is a one-to-one is -one mapping when you have the exponent being within ZQ. So R and S, so H and U fully define R and S, but that means that uh, V, the H, the power of S component of V is also fully defined, so M is, there is only a single value M that can be, that can explain this triple. So this is perfect binding, and even an all-powerful committer cannot afterwards change the value that he committed to. In terms of hiding, this is computational hiding simply from the security of Elgamal encryption. Because these are, uh, if you have commitments to M and M prime being two different values, it's exactly like having uh, two different encryptions of different values and we know that you can't distinguish between them. Okay, so this is a very easy, perfectly binding commitment. And uh, we're actually going to use perfectly hiding commitments, not perfectly binding. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much why the exact why that is, it's a subtlety in the proof. But the basic idea is to have the verifier first prove that, uh, or maybe before I do that I should explain what the difficulty is in proving that signal protocols are zero knowledge. Remember that in order to prove that something is zero knowledge, I need to be able to generate a transcript of the, uh, a transcript of the proof uh, given only the, uh, the input statement. Now, if it's honest verifier zero knowledge, then I know what the verifier challenge is going to be because I can just look at what's written on its random tape. But in general, a cheating verifier can have a random value hardwired inside its code, or even worse, it could choose its challenge as a function of the first prover value. <coughs> Let's think about this really horrible case where the verifier chooses the challenge E by applying a pseudo-random function to the first uh, uh, prover uh, message. Now we know how to simulate, if I'm given E, I can then find Z and E, Z and A. So I need to generate this triple A, E and Z. If I already know the challenge, I can do it fine. But if I don't, then I'm not able to do it. So now I'm trying to simulate, I send the value A to the uh, verifier and I hope, to, I hope for the best, it's gonna send me an E which matches what I know how to answer. I only know how to answer one, because if I knew how to answer two, then I would actually know the witness. But on the simulator, I don't know the witness, I only know the public input. So I send an A and I get back an E, the probability it's going to match is very, very small, it's 2 to the minus T. 
so I can't simulate. Somehow I have to know the value of E before I send A. That's not going to work in a Sigma protocol. So the way we do this is we, we uh, have the verifier first commit to the value E before the prover even sends A. Okay, so the verify commits to a challenge E. The way we do this is we use a perfectly hiding commitment scheme. Uh, these schemes actually have two rounds, so the prover sends the first match of the commitment protocol, and then the verifier commits to its challenge E. After that, the prover sends the message A. The verifier sends the decommitment, which is E and, and the randomness that used in the commitment, so E and R. And then the prover checks that this is indeed a correct decommitment. If it is, it completes the, completes the proof with the replied Z. And then the verifier accepts again in the same way as beforehand. Intuitively, well, completeness obviously hasn't changed. Intuitively, soundness also stays the same. And the reason why soundness stays the same is because the verifier indeed sent a commitment to E beforehand, but by the hiding property, the prover learns nothing whatsoever about that, about that value. So when the prover sends A, it still doesn't know anything about E. I mean, if the prover knew E before it sent A, then we'd be in a terrible situation. Obviously, it could cheat because it could run the simulation. But it doesn't know it, and therefore the proof is in exactly the same situation as beforehand, and soundness is preserved. Okay, so that's what we said here, but why, why do we have zero knowledge now? As I said beforehand, uh, I, the, proof, the simulator tries to send A and gets back an E, but the E is not going to match that A, and so it's sort of stuck. But let's look at what happens now. Uh, the simulator interacts with this verifier and it gets the commitment to, uh, to the verifier's challenge and it sends a random A prime. Just a random A prime, uh, randomly generated according to what the protocol says. It doesn't need to know the witness for it. And then it receives the verifier's decommitment. Once it receives the verifier's decommitment, it says, great, now I know what the challenge is. Let me go a step back and start again and send a different A. Now an A that actually matches that E that I know how to answer. Again, rewinding, think about virtualization and taking a snapshot of the verifier, and now rewinding it back to that previous state and continuing from there. The verifier has no idea that it's been rewound, so its distribution at the end will look exactly the same. Okay? Uh, so you repeat this now until V decommits, de decommits to E, and when V decommits to E, then you actually, uh, um, when B decommits to E, then you're able to complete the proof because you've chosen every time A and Z in a way that they match the value E that you want to answer. Okay, so that, to analyze that exactly is a little bit more involved, but intuitively this is, this is perfectly fine. Okay, the reason why it works is because the, proof, the verifier is already bound to that value E after the first commitment, so even though I'm rewinding it every time, it's unable to change E. So this really horrible verifier that we talked about that applies a pseudorandom function to the first prover message in order to compute E is unable to work because it's actually committed to E before it gets the first message from the prover. So that's why we get zero knowledge. How do we do these perfectly hiding commitments? Maybe they're really inefficient? No, actually Pedersen uh, showed us uh, many, many years ago how to do this very, very nicely and efficiently. We have again a group with a generator G and order Q. The commitment protocol is really simple. You choose a random K. In order to commit to a value X, you just simply send G to the R times H to the X. Okay, so you have a random, random uh, uh, R and just G to the R times H to the X. And I want to claim first that this is perfectly hiding, and that's actually very easy, because for every x and y, there exists, there exists a pair r and s, so that r plus kx equals s plus ky. And there's no way of knowing if this, if this value c that you received was generated using r and x, or using s and y. They both reach exactly the same point, so you have no idea what value was committed to. What about binding? According to that, it seems okay, but if that's the case, then I can break binding. I can simply solve this equation and then break the binding. The problem is that this equation is in the exponent, and it's hard to work in the exponent in these groups because of discrete log, etc. So computationally binding is simply, but if you notice that if you can compute x, r, and y, s, 
the g to the r times h dx equals g to the s times h to the y, then once again you can, can by you can transfer a size and you can get that the discrete log of h is actually r minus s divided by y minus x. Very similar to what we did exactly in the sigma protocol for Schnorr for the discrete log. So if you can actually break binding, then you can solve the discrete log problem, which is hard, and it's, and it's perfectly hiding. Once again, we now have a commitment scheme which has, uh, how many? It has uh, two exponentiations to, uh, to commit and likewise to uh, decommit, uh, to verify the decommitment. So this is very, very efficient. By the way, g to the r times h to the x costs you about one and a half exponentiations, or one and a third. It doesn't even cost you two using Shamir's trick. Okay, so using Pedersen commitments, this costs only a few additional exponentiations and so it's very, very efficient. Uh, if we want to get a proof of knowledge, then this won't be a proof of knowledge. Uh, the reason why it won't be a proof of knowledge is because when you want to extract, you have exactly the other problem. In order to extract, remember that we said that for a sigma protocol, how can I extract? If I have a single A and I have two different continuations, I have E and E prime and Z and Z prime, they can't, then I can extract. So now I'm an extractor who I'm interacting with the cheating prover and I want to get out the witness. So what I do is I give it an A and then I get an E and Z, I send it an E, sorry I don't give it an A, I get an A, I give it an E and get a Z then I rewind it and give it E prime and get Z prime. But the new protocol now requires me to commit to the challenge before I start. So I give it E, commit it, I'm committed to E before I start and then the prover gives me A, I'm unable to give it now E and E prime. So I'm stuck. So it's exactly the flip problem beforehand, so this is not a proof of knowledge. Um, and we can actually solve this by uh, using something called a, a trapdoor or equivocal commitment scheme, which enables you to cheat and open in two ways. You might think this is going to be expensive, but actually all you need to do is take the previous protocol that we had and uh, add in the last, the last message have the uh, prover give the discrete log of the uh, H that was used in Pedersen commitments and then everything goes through. So it's actually additional single exponentiation only and everything goes through. So again, a proof of knowledge is very, very cheap. Okay, so we actually want zero knowledge. So why did I bother you with sigma protocols? Why didn't I just directly go for zero knowledge? As I said, we have many useful transformations. So we can do parallel composition, compound statements, which we've actually used we have used these things in, in protocols for secret computation. We have these transformations for zero knowledge and zero knowledge proof of knowledge. And the nice thing about sigma protocols is that if I want to do the and, the or, the parallel composition of many sigma protocols, the result is always a sigma protocol. So I can do a, a whole lot of manipulation of a whole lot of different things, and at the end do a single transformation to a zero knowledge, and it becomes and it and it remains very very efficient. On the uh, side as uh, as a, someone who has to write manually has to write classic proofs on paper, uh, of course not with your hand but typing, uh, it's actually much easier to work with sigma protocols simply because the definitions are less distribution based and more, so they're more concrete, so they're easy to work with. So how can we use sigma protocols in zero knowledge? So let's say I want to prove to you that um, the Elgamal encryption UV under some public key H is actually to the value M. Okay, so I have an Elgamal encryption and I want to prove to you that this Elgamal encryption, this ciphertext encrypts the value M. Now, it's not clear at all how to do that because I don't want to reveal to you my secret key, my decryption key. And I'm unable to give you the randomness. In RSA it's actually quite easy because I can give you the randomness to generate the encryption because when I decrypt I actually get the randomness back. But it's not the case in uh, it's not the case at all in um, in El Gamal. In El Gamal, actually, when you decrypt, you, even the decryptor cannot get the randomness used to generate the encryption. So I want to convince you this is the plain text, but without revealing my secret key. Well, if you look at something very very interesting, by definition, the encryption is g to the r and h to the r times m. So let's look at the tuple, which is g h u and v divided by m. It's actually going to be g h u to the g to the r h to the r this last value here will be h to the r what's g h g to the r h to the r it's a diffie hellman tuple so if i want to prove to you that m is the plain text that was encrypted in g h u v i just have to prove to you that g h u v divided by m is a diffie hellman tuple 
So it's an example of where this is a very, very useful tool and you can actually use it to prove a whole lot of other statements. So I have a d database of Elgam unencrypted values and I want to release a single value but without revealing uh, the secret key and I want to release it in a way which is provable. I can't cheat you. I can't uh, take the encrypted database and change it later on. I can't claim that it's a different value. Actually, I have to give you the correct value. And you can do this using this zero-knowledge proof, which are very, very, very efficient. If you want to talk about concrete times in concrete groups that we use, this is under a millisecond to prove. Sometimes we don't want uh, interaction. Uh, sometimes you don't want interaction because we're lazy and we'd like things to be fast. And sometimes you don't want interaction because actually it changes the properties of where it can be useful. So in fact, we can use Sigma protocols to get signature schemes, and signature schemes have to be non-interactive. But there are some cases where, for example, if I can do two rounds secure computation, which means I send a message and I get a message back, this is something that can feasibly be done by email. Whereas if we need something which is highly interactive, then this is going to take a, a, a very, very long time. So sometimes it, can, it changes the way you're able to work when you're able to remove interaction. So Fiat Shamir have a heuristic which enables you to convert any Sigma protocol into full zero knowledge uh, non-interactively. It's actually impossible to do. We can prove that you cannot do non-interactive zero knowledge without any additional setup. So it uses the random oracle model. Okay, we're going to model the hash function, a hash function as a random oracle, and in that setting we're going to be able to prove that it's zero knowledge. And it's actually very simple. This challenge that is computed from, uh, uh, that is typically computed by the verifier, is actually just going to be computed by applying the hash function to the statement and the first proof of value. Okay, so in order to prove a statement X, I generate the value A, I apply the hash function to A and X, and then I get back E, and I use that as the verifier challenge, and I compute Z. And then I just send A, E, and Z, and the verifier can verify in the same way by computing, taking A, computing H of A and X to get E, and then verifying that Z is correct. The reason why this maintains uh, the security is that, for example, uh, or just think what it means, what does it mean that you're in a random oracle model? It means that you're actually interacting with an external random function who gives you, you give it A and you get back E. So it's exactly the interaction of, that we were talking about beforehand. So when you're interacting with this external random oracle, it's exactly the same as interacting with an external verifier. So it's cheating, of course, but it's a heuristic. Uh, so in summary, uh, efficient zero knowledge is actually very important in secret computation protocols. For example, in getting oblivious transfer, I mentioned this morning oblivious transfer that's fully simulatable, Actually, uh, if you don't want to have any setup, the most efficient way of doing that is to actually use a, a zero-knowledge protocol that something is a Diffie-Hellman tuple. So we actually use that inside the protocol. Using Sigma protocols, we can make these very, very efficient, uh, and we can transfer them to efficient zero-knowledge, zero proof knowledge, non-interactive zero-knowledge, and there are many other applications as well. <coughs> Thank you. And, yeah.